Parak Dina Mamani's Bishlesha, sponsored for Bracha Vatzlacha for Rina Bas Malka. Rava brings another example of Pagin and Dibura, splitting a testimony. Husband testified his wife committed adultery. The testimony about his wife is inadmissible. Concerning the adulterer combines with another testimony to execute him. Rava teaches a husband is a relative to his wife as to himself. He cannot testify specifically about her or even about them. It is inadmissible for her. Rava brings a few rulings concerning Hazama, reciprocal punishment. Number one. Witnesses who testified a man committed adultery did not identify the woman, were subsequently falsified. The biblical law of Kashazam requires they be executed. However, if they identified her, a minor adulteress, they pay the market value of the ksuba to her father. It is not kamle bidarabmine because their testimony affected two different people, the original witnesses and her father. However, if she was a Nara or older, the witnesses would be exempt from pain because being executed in pain is because of their intention for her only. Number two, Rav expresses the same ruling regarding an ox. The false witnesses identified the sodomizer, but not the ox. They are executed, but do not pay the owner of the ox. However, if they identify the ox, they must compensate its owner because their testimony affected two different people the original witnesses, and the owner of the ox. However, where he testifies his ox was sodomized, the testimony concerning the sodomizer is accepted, concerning the ox as well, because a man is not related to his property. Mishnah brings a dispute between the Tanakam and Rabbi Shmuel concerning the size of a cord necessary for administering lashes. The Gemara discusses the source for each opinion. Torah states, Ki Yariv Ushvatum. A dispute is judged by two. One more is added to a best and shuckle and even number court. A question. The verse also states, Vitzdiku v'hirshiu, indicating four more. The answer. These words teach false witnesses receive lashes where the reciprocal punishment is not imposed. For example, they falsely testified that a Kohen was a Cholom. His mother married his Kohen father after being divorced. Their punishment for false testimony is lashes, this is the only interpretation of the combined verses that makes sense. The as Why would the evildoer be sentenced to lashes because the court exonerated the innocent litigant? Therefore, the verse is not referring to judges, but witnesses who testify about an innocent that he is guilty. Subsequently, other witnesses testified exonerating him. The verse teaches the false witnesses receive lashes rather than a reciprocal punishment. It cannot be learned from the general prohibition against false testimony, lo because lashes are not administered for a negative commandment not involving action. Rabbi Shmuel derives a court of 23. Number one, Abai states, Shava, Russia, Russia. Here it states, Bin HaKois HaRasha, and regarding murder, it states, Lo Sikhu Kofer, the Russia, Lamus. Just as a murder trial requires 23, so to one to administer lashes. Number two, Rava claims lashes is a form of death penalty. Despite this, the court evaluates the amount of a perpetrator can, can, can sustain. The verse states, Your brother must be alive after receiving lashes. The Mishnah states, The intercalation of a day into the previous month requires a court of three. The Gemara understands a court at the end of the month declares this month has been extended to 30 days rather than 29. A question. It seems unnecessary to require a court to do this. By not sanctifying the 30th day, it remains automatically part of the previous month. The answer. Number one. Abai explains the Mishnah refers to sanctifying the new moon by three judges required whether the previous month was 29 or 30 days. Number two. Rav explains the Mishnah refers to Kiddush Biyom Ibur, sanctification on the 30th day by three judges. Rabbi Lezab Reb Tzadik calls it is not necessary to sanctify the 31st day. It is sanctified by the heavenly court on the 30th day. Number three, Rav Nachman explains it refers to Kiddush Achar Ibur, sanctifying the 31st day by a court of three. This follows the opinion of Plimo, sanctification is not biblical. It is required with the Rabbanan on a day not anticipated to be Rosh Chodesh, the 31st to, re to reinforce the court's postponement. Number four, 
Ravashi explains it refers to calculating the moon by a chord of three. Sanctification is never necessary. It used the term Ibu to coincide with the term in the Mishnah, Ibu Shana. This follows the Tana Rabbi Eliezer, sanctification is only required for Yovel. Rabbi Shmuel requires a progressive amount of judges to proclaim a leap year. Three judges preside. If unanimously in favor, they declare a leap year. If two in favor, they add another two to deliberate. If three of the five are in favor, another two are added. Some opinions hold they do not deliberate anymore, but simply declare it a leap year. Other opinions hold the seven deliberate before declaring. During the first or second stage, a majority of the not in favor to extend the year ends deliberations. One interpretation is the 357 corresponds to the amount of words in each verse of Birchus Kehani. Another interpretation it is co it corresponds to the gatekeepers in the temple and officers of a king. The court arranging season should reflect the heavenly kingdom. If you're enjoying Daphne 5, please click on the link below, subscribe, and become a sponsor. Thank you.